God, I want to see the church reformed. And it's not popular in a Lutheran country. <laughs> like, hey, let, let's, re let's reform the church here because the reformation as Luther did was not good enough. I want to welcome you to this very special interview. A few days ago, Ken Fish interviewed me to his podcast, God is not a furry. And it was really special. It was really, really good. The questions was really good and, and the flow with it was amazing. There was many things that was talked about, my experience in jail, persecution, but also reformation of the church and how to live this life. Yeah, we covered many, many, many special areas about the world today and the church today. And I really encourage you to see the whole interview. Grant, who was also there together with Ken Fish, he said after the interview was finished, he said like, whoa, like Tom, I just want to sit with you for three hours and ask questions because there's so much here we need to talk about. And I believe this is going to bless you. So see the interview, I put it here in here in the full link. And if you want to do an interview with me like this in your podcast, or other things, you can reach out to torbensondergaard.com, torbensondergaard.com, where you also can read more, read more about my case and the new book I've written, and I wrote in jail that will come out soon and many more things. God bless you out there. See the interview and reach out to me if there's questions. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton. And on today's episode, we have another interview. It's going to be exciting. I'm, I've been looking forward to this. And so uh, without further ado, Ken, why don't you introduce uh, our next guest? Yeah, on the show today, we have uh, Torben Sondergaard. And many of you who keep up with Christian news on the international scene would be aware that um, Torben went through, a, I would say, a fiery trial uh, of faith and dealing with our government here in the U.S. as well as his own government back home. Um, and that seemingly got resolved I, I only, a, only a couple of months ago. Uh, I, I want to say it was maybe four months ago or so that it, that it resolved from memory. Um, I may be off on that, and I didn't go Google it to fact check the storyline, but it's relatively recent. Torben will give us some update on that. Torben's one of the few people that we've had on the show that I don't know in one way or another, but we know people in common, and uh, his story is just so compelling and electrifying. I thought we got to have him on the show. So, Torben, welcome to the show. It's good to be here. I'm excited. So, I'm actually sitting in Mexico right now. So there is some kids playing on the back background, so I don't hope there's too much noise there. Yeah, we can't hear it at all, so it's oh, good. it's good, and it's got to be great to be out doing your ministry once again. It is, it is, it's amazing. Uh, it's been half half year now, half year since I got released, but um, it was different than I expected. Like the way it happened, like we can start with the release. It was like handcuffs on and deported by two officers and sent out of the country. And uh, they put me in jail in JFK airport first because I'm too dangerous to walk around. Even there was two officers and one policeman around me. Then I was put in jail a few hours before I was deported out. So yeah, a lot of crazy stories to tell. <laughs> well, you know, you're in good company because the apostle Paul, uh, he talked about the chain that he wore. Mm. And, uh, you know, I don't think once Paul was no longer killing Christians, I don't think he was a dangerous man in terms of violence, but he was dangerous to the powers that be. And uh, certainly the message that he brought was one that was going to upend the world. Yeah. You know, I, in Homeland Security today, I'm, I'm still put up as a national security threat. Mm. And and um, I, 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 I was playing a lot with those words like I, I'm never been arrested by anything i never been charged by anything this day today i know in front of our judge when it comes to some of the crazy accusations i experienced against me um and i'm a national security threat but then i thought about but if you look at the spiritual world the kingdom of god this is what we are supposed to be we are all supposed to be nest national security threat to the enemy of this world and and, and when I tell my story here, I want everyone to think from the beginning that it's, it's not just because people think, oh, it's because it's Torben and he's like 
the way he is. Like I, I know of other ministry, other people who had problems in the past and and I thought I was safe somehow because I'm not like that person. I'm not like that person. I'm not like that person. Therefore, I'm safe. But I think my message is that no one is safe in that way. Like this is what Jesus has promised us. But but through this journey, I, I experienced a freedom. And I would say today I was, I'm really happy I did not come out after a month. Because if I come out after a month, I've come up depressed, full of anxiety, full of fear. I was really a bad place in my life. Um, the shock was just so, like, I, I couldn't understand it, you know. And then uh, I experienced freedom. <laughs> I experienced freedom in jail. And I experienced revelation in the word of God and revival and wrote two books and many things happened. So so now I come out with a message and, and it's really to prepare the church for what is coming. Because as I believe now, it is only a few right now, but later it will be many. But in the end, it will be everyone who confessed Jesus Lord, because this is what the Bible has promised us. When they arrest you, he said to his disciples when he sent them out in Matthew 10. And and this is what can happen today also. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, um, so everybody knows you've been in jail for your faith. Let's back up to how you came to faith and... Uh walk them into the present yeah uh, baptized in the Lutheran church in denmark confirmed without ever open a bible without any, ever praying a prayer in my family home uh, we have no tradition with bible prayers i went to church three times in my whole life that was when i was confirmed in the Lutheran church so i have no faith um life was hard i experienced problems when i was younger my mom became sick when i was 16 became handicapped and, and I feel life was hard. I got a job as a baker. I was living in sin, living in the world. And I was frustrated. I was a little depressed, I would say. And one night I looked up in the sky and I said, come on, God, there must be more than life than this. There'll be more than life than going up, going to work, going home and sleep and next day and next day. And when I said, God, if you're there, I said, come and take me. And I was thinking of UFO would beat me up and fly away with me. I was not thinking of Jesus, not the Bible, God of the Bible, not at all. But it, it was the start. And, and a week later, I heard about Jesus through a friend. And I came to church for the first time, 5th of April, 1995, 18 years old. Gave my life to God, repented. The Holy Spirit came into my life. And my life was changed. I walked out that door. I looked up in the sky again. I did not say this time, God, if you're there, come and take me. This time I looked up in the sky and I said, hi. <laughs> like, hi, I, I know you are there, but I don't know you. Like, who are you? So I came from believe, think maybe there is a God. It could be an alien. I don't know what it was. To I know that God was real. To from there, it's, it became a journey with with seeking God, praying fast, and reading the Bible, and and a long journey where I've got to know Him as in a very special way. So I'm excited. I think it's interesting, especially because of the state of Europe right now, that you actually had a belief in God. You didn't particularly know Him well, and you were you know estranged, um, living in the world, as you say, but but you still knew there was a God. Do you think that a lot of your countrymen, do you think a lot of other people across Europe is, you know, that you know or maybe know about, do they do they believe in God or have they forsaken even the belief in God? I would say if I look at Denmark as a nation, uh, 75% are still members of the Lutheran Church, baptized as babies, but... I would say if you go out on the street and talk with people, most people will say, I'm an atheist. I believe in evolution. This is what most people would say. Like in my childhood, I have never met a personal Christian. I've never met a born again Christian. I did not know the phrase born again. So, so I was the first one in my family. And I don't know of anyone in my family, even third out with second, third cousins who was born again believers. And, and but I think like may, most people, they are seeking something, and, and they're seeking. We 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 know there is more than life than this, and people are seeking. Uh, but many people they don't know where to seek, and that's why, especially in Europe, most people 
they, they somehow say they're atheists, but they have all created their own God. <laughs> like we, we believe in my God in my way. Like this is my God. This is the one I believe in. And no, my God is not like this. No, no. My God, he's sweet. My God is like this. And I think this is the biggest idol we have in Europe and many other places. It's we because we don't know the Bible, we create our own God and and one day we are atheists, and the next day we have a problem. And we pay, pray to our God, and I think most people have it like that. Yeah, I, I've heard I've heard that said many times that if people don't know the Bible, then they don't know the God of the Bible, and therefore they make up a God pretty much according to their own dictates, whatever whatever they think they want or need. That's sort of where it lands. Yeah. No. All right. So, um, so you. You were part of the Lutheran Church in Denmark, and I know the Lutheran Church, and many of our many of our listeners wouldn't, so this is more for them than than for you. But uh, the the Nordic countries in general, Norway, uh, Sweden, of course, Denmark, and I think to a lesser extent, Finland, have a fairly strong Lutheran tradition. And uh, this is coming out of the Reformation that Martin Luther led. Northern Europe tended toward. Uh, Protestantism, but yeah. these churches are all state churches, which is to say, among other things, they are funded by the state. Um, but with that, there's a kind of I don't know lethargy. Uh, you might even say necrosis um, on Christianity in, in that environment. Uh, and so, let's just say this: going into the ministry is probably not career option one through 10 on anybody's list for the most part. There might be the odd devout, you know, sort of modern version of Samuel or Jesus out there. But but generally, I don't think people would be thinking about that. How in the world did you enter the ministry? Yeah, just give a little idea of, of Denmark and the culture. Uh, six million people around there. Uh, out of those six million people, most people are, are members of the Lutheran Church, but it's, it's something we did, like, I don't know of anyone in my family in my school who was not baptized as babies. We all confirmed. It was on the school schedule when we went to school, confirmation, gymnastic, confirmation, math, Danish school. <laughs> it's part of it without really knowing God. So it's, it's a state religion. It's very different than finding a Lutheran church in another country because here it's just something you do with tradition and burial and, and wedding and all of that. So out of those 6 million people, Pentecostal Christian in Denmark is 5,000. 5,000 in the whole of Denmark. Wow. B Baptist believers in Denmark, 2,000. Mm. We're not talking about church. We're talking about 2,000 <laughs> Baptists out of the whole nation. So the, the our big church in Denmark, Pentecostal church, is 150, 200 people. Like, like there's a few days a little bigger because they've gone together because churches are closing. So when I came to Orlando first, first time to Florida, there's churches in Orlando that is bigger than there is Pentecostal in the whole of Denmark. So because of that, it's like when we in Europe look at the news, for example, let's say there's election in America and you have president who say, hey, I'm a born again believer, you know, even if they're not born again, they use the phrase, why? Right? Because to speak to the people, if you use the phrase born again in Europe, the ambulance will come and put you on the close apartment with the hospital or something. There's something off with you. So, so it's two very, very different cultures. And, and I would say for not American guy come to America, first coming in, I was happy for it. everyone was born again. And then I find out it's a strong tradition. And when you start to peel down the layers, what you see inside is not what you think there is. In, in Europe, it's different. So for me, the first one, my family was Christian. Everyone was against me. My father was against me. They did not speak with me. But I love Jesus. And I had a longing to, to seek him and live for him and and I was working with uh, helping with church plan and discipleship. But after six years, I was I was still like, when I read this, I was like, it's more. Like, I, I see the book of Acts. I see the early disciples. I see the life out of living. And I, I'm a radical, radical Christian, love Jesus. But I, I, I did nothing of this. I've never seen anyone heal. 
I've never seen a demon. Like it's the demons in Denmark. I've never seen it. I did not know about it, but I read it here. And I was like, then there's something off someplace. It can be my life or it can be the Bible, but it's, it's never the Bible. So it must be my life. So so my, my ministry really started with fasting. I, I took a 40 days fast. I thought it was the most radical thing I can do. And I start to see God and I start to fast. And because I like that, there must be more than this. And and when I started that fast, afterward, things start to happen. I start to see people get healed. I start to see demons coming out. I start to see people come to faith. And and and, and it it was mainly out on the street in the beginning, going to shops on the street, praying for people with crosses and sharing the gospel, baptizing in the bathtub at home. Um, but it grew like this, and in, in a few, few years later, 2002 to four, I was on national TV many times in Denmark. Um, just one story, one time I got a prophetic word that I should pray for so many people in one time, they would get healed, that we could not count it. And, and when I got that word, I was thinking maybe on the platform with a lot of people, but then I got another word that I would be on TV. And I knew it was God. So when I was praying at home, I was like, God, thank you. One day I'm going to be on TV. I'm going to pray for the sake. And I was imagining in my prayer room, how do I do it? Like, how do I lay the hands on the camera like, like this or like this? I don't shake too much, don't be nervous. And I was praying that for over a year in my room. God, thank you. One day I'm going to be on TV. I'm going to pray for the sake. And then it came one day from the biggest non-Christian public TV station in Denmark. They called and asked if I want to be part of the program. And I said, yes, if I can pray for the sake. And they're like, uh, yeah, yeah, if you want to. And that happened. Like, I think there was 800,000 out of 6 million who saw it. And I put the hand on the camera and I prayed. And people got healed all over Denmark. And people called in. I got healed. And I met God. I got healed. And then they told about it the day after. Uh, so that really took off in Denmark. Uh, my, my ministry in Denmark with praying for sick people. and. and preaching the gospel like that. So you didn't you didn't enter the ministry in the conventional path, i.e. go to seminary, um, get ordained, um, take a state church. You just started ministering. The Lord started using you. And with that, I mean, this really sets the stage for why yeah. there might be people within the state church that aren't so thrilled with what you do. Yeah, you, you know, X we see with the lame man heal and Peter and John was standing there and, and was, um, the, the people was like, what shall we do? Like the lame man is healed. And what? And, and when they understood that they were on learn, on school, on educated man, but then have been with Jesus. And and I've said, yes, I, I haven't. I've been with Jesus. Let's say it like this. Uh, and, and I'm saying in a, in a place then a few years later, I, I started um, another ministry where I went public on English, and, and we call it the last reformation out of a book about the reformation. And mm -hmm. and, and and the book starts with, we have the book of Acts, the early Christianity, and then uh, through Constantine, year 300 and forward, we got what it became, the Catholic Church. And then Martin Luther came like 500 years ago in Wittenberg, Germany, with the 95 Thesis. And, and, and out of this, the Reformation was born. But Martin Luther did not reform the Catholic Church back to the Book of Acts. We still have baby baptism. We still have the Sunday Church building, the priesthood, the way the Catholic Church have it. We still have a lot of things. And there's still no baptism for the Holy Spirit, no power, no healing, nothing of that. So Martin Luther did not reform the church. And, and it was what I really got in my heart. I want to see the church reformed. And... It's not popular in a Luton country. Like, hey, let, let's re let's reform the church here because the reformation as Luther did was not good enough. Um, so you understand that that it is being looked down on on many yeah. places. Yeah. 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 And so suddenly you were having an amazing experience with the Lord, but um you were having people who weren't who weren't too excited about what you were doing supernaturally. Um, I had a similar situation to that, although I wasn't having to live in it. I was a guest in the country, uh, but it's a country over in the in the uh, Transcaucasus region. I, I won't name it, but um, anyway, we went we went there, and I had some guys in long black robes, 
um, who were clerics asked me, but they literally said to me, by what right and what authority are you doing these things? Mm -hmm. And there, there was quite a heated exchange. I had somebody who was a local with me serving as a translator and, and this individual who's now with the Lord, not because of what happened, but came, came down with cancer and died. Uh, but this individual got in a very heated exchange and was rebuking these guys for not standing up for the Lord and doing the right thing. And uh, anyway, in the end, believe it or not, we won them over. And the guy said to me, I want you to come back and preach when you return to my country, which was the last thing I expected to have happen. I thought we were going to end up being arrested. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so it had a, it had a better ending. But anyway, there are many people who are in countries where there are these uh, I think the, the term that is sometimes used by missiologists, legacy churches, they've been around for a while. Uh, they're entrenched in the culture. And I think there are many times when what you stand for, what we stand for, and the things that we do, it's so bewildering to them. They they literally don't have a sort of a, a space, a grid, a box to put it in. And it's like it fries all their circuits and their heads explode. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I was to say, if you look at Denmark, I would say, like every other country, there is freedom to believe in everything the Bible says. But if you start to obey what the Bible says, yeah. and I think this is the thing, because most Christian churches in Denmark, free, Pentecostal churches, uh, we believe in healing, we believe in cast out demons, so on. But but when you start to really cast out demons, not only believe in it, but actually start to do it, then our enemy he will look at you and you get the focus from the enemy. And I think that is the thing that starts to happen in Denmark, that it grew. We had a big training center. We had people from over 30 nations coming to Denmark to get trained. And, and uh, a, uh, a lot of things happened. It was really beautiful. And then persecution hit in a way I've never experienced before. And it, it came to that place where I was on national TV like almost every, every day for a whole month. They have undercover journalists coming to us from national TV pretending to be Christian to be baptized. I actually baptized two undercover journalists. Uh, it was really frightening. Like I, I had no idea. I could not imagine that they were lying with everything that seemed sincere. When they came out of the water, I knew something was off. I couldn't put words on it, but I just like something off here. And then I found out they have had hidden camera. They have tried to manipulate the clips and put it together and. And like the way they did it, just like said, but we, we had a meeting also in London with 800 people. A lot of people were baptized. People got some free demons uh, uh, left. And, and you know, it, it can be loud sometimes. And there it was loud. Demons came out and, and yeah. a lot of things happened. But, but you know, when you are there and see it, you don't, don't go away with fear. You go away with hallelujah. The name of Jesus is stronger than anything else. Because you don't end up with the deliverance, you end up with the joy, like, hallelujah, I'm free. But what did TV do? They never filmed the joy. They only filmed the back part. Then there was a young boy who saw the baptism. He had autism. And he wanted to jump in the pool and swim. So he took his trousers off because he wanted to swim. The mom said no. And he became angry, like, ah because he did not understand what was happening. He just wanted to swim in the pool. And they were filming him with trousers down. And it became the trailer on national TV. Oh. This young boy got traumatized because of the deliverance. And we have experts in Denmark saying, hey, we need to put a law up and forbid this because Tom Sonnagon and people like him are traumatizing kids. Look at this young boy. He's hysteria. He's crying he's traumatized because he's so afraid because of the deliverance no he just wants to dive dive in the pool and swim with the other people and and this is what tv was doing the, the lies and the manipulation and it came to the government where they talked about me in the parliament in denmark and i actually want to set up a law and and that was the reason i like they also came out for our case. A lot of things happened. I have it on my friend website, TomSondergaard.com, where there's a whole timeline. And then I end up leaving to America to a land of the free, home of the brave. Like, you know, and uh, I was put in jail in America. 
I was about to say uh, you found it to be less than free. You know, I th I think everyone who listens to this know that America is changing. Or let's say like this, things have been revealed. If you look at election, Trump, everything that's him right now, like media, all of it, I was put just in the middle of all of this. I was in America, did nothing wrong, sending my papers correctly, pay my tax, did everything correct. They opened the borders up. Millions of illegal immigrants are walking over the border. I have a big network in America. They said I was smuggling weapons from Mexico to America. And then they put me in chains here, hands, chains around my hip, chains on my legs, hands to my hip, the lease, uh, shoe lease off my shoes. And then they dragged me to jail where I spent uh, 412 days. And um, with murders and other things in the beginning. And, and it was just like, I was in shock in the beginning. Later I found out that it was actually ICE who detained me was part of it. Like two, three months after being detained, um, we found out that the ICE officer who detained me, he called a civilian on the outside who did not like me, said he should go to Homeland Security and report me for human trafficking. Because then he came on my files and then he took and put me up as a national security threat who was on an investigation by FBI and Homeland Security for human trafficking. <laughs> and it's just so, so that was just one of the things. Try to imagine being in jail <laughs> and knowing that the people who put you in jail were trying to sit up a criminal case against you by getting people to report you falsely for things you have not done. Um, I guess this is, is why yeah. the Bible has its commandment against bearing false witness. I would say I look forward to the day of the Lord and a new heaven and new earth where righteous would dwell and where we are going to trust the nations because uh, it, there I will be on the other side on the table because everything I experienced, to be honest, in this legal system in America was just so shocking. And and I saw many things. I witnessed many things in there. They took me in, actually, interrogated me, threatened me, recorded me on camera, wanted me to sign papers, and I was not allowed to talk with my lawyer. The, the, my off eyes officer was on me. The, the, he, he was forbidden to talk to my lawyer. Like, why? Like, what is happening here? Um, so, and and then, you know, it's just a weird world. Most people I was with was have stayed in a, the country illegal, broken the law, was detained. Most people like we don't want to spend time a lawyer. We get deported and then we pay instead of get ten thousand dollars to a lawyer, they paid eight times into cartel and then they're over the border one more time. So it, it takes two weeks. Back to Mexico and then back in America. Try to imagine every person go over the border and then time it with 8,000 and then give it to the cartel. Yeah. That's, that's just amazing. So how did this situation ultimately get resolved? I mean, my friend Eric was yeah. that, but I, I don't even know exactly how central that, how did this get to no. close? I would say oh. uh, Clay Higgins who's uh, in Louisiana district. He is the chairman of the Homeland Security and Border Control. I have a letter with from him here. He was asking the right question that what is happening here? And he demands answer. And he spoke about me in the Congress where he said in the Congress that I was being persecuted by the sitting administration and they believe it's because I, I'm an evangelical Christian. So, so in that sense, uh, I did not get justice, but on, on one side of the, of the government, there was people who, who recognized me and saw that I was being persecuted because of my faith. But what actually happened, and that is the thing I'm going to say now, that is surprise, is first time I say it public, I was just told a few days ago, I actually lost my asylum case. What happened is that I was in jail I lost first in the immigration court. We have, we appealed to the 11th circuit. And uh, because everything that happened in the immigration court was just weird. Like when my court case happened in the immigration court, there was five people in the court case. I was sitting online 
uh, sitting and, and I have a picture of it. No, I don't have a picture. I was sitting there and the judge let one of my enemies in. One of the people on YouTube who don't like me, he was invited in. He was in the room and he recorded illegal and he put my case on YouTube half hour, an hour later. Never happened before. So many things here never happened before. So I lost. I knew that. So we appealed to the 11th circuit. While we appealed, uh, I was I was set free, so I could still go out while my case was running, and that was why I was set free the uh, August 16, and and was deported back to Denmark. And my case has still been running since until a few days ago. I was told that it was denied, and if that had happened a, a year ago, two years ago, I would have been shocked. Now I'm not shocked. Why? It's what to expect. Like, like, like everything about this case has been so weird. The reason for denying my case made no sense. Uh, for example, the first thing they said was I overstayed my visa. That was what Clay Hayden said. What is happening here? Because I did not overstay my visa. No, what actually happened was they canceled my visa without me knowing it. So they went in, in and canceled my visa and then said, look, he overstayed. And they had not given a reason why they canceled my visa. So I would say it's denied. Uh, I'm Mexico right now. Um, I still have investigation. I hope it's going to be continue. I still hope Clay Higgins, please reach out to him, everyone who knows it, and support him, say keep fighting. I, I still would like to know why. Why did they put me in jail? Why did they say I overstayed when I did not? Why did the ICE officer detain me, put false accusation against human trafficking? Why did he set me up as a national security threat? Why am I still a national security threat? Because as long as I'm a national security threat in one of the biggest countries in the world, it, 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 it don't make it easy for me. So I'm like, I, I, I still believe in justice and hope to get that. And I still believe there is a work God want to do with me in America. Uh, but I don't know how it will happen, to be honest. I have no idea. So this is my case right now. It sounds from what you said earlier, and now with this, you don't actually at this moment have the option to re-enter the United States, do you? No, no. I have to, uh, everything I do have to go to Homeland Security. Yeah. And uh, there are some people there who for no reason, don't like me. Uh, and, and I don't know how high it is and and and, and all of that, you know. I, I have some papers from, from Clay Higgins. I have other things, but, but what is going on behind the scenes, I, I actually don't know. Uh, what I know is that if I look at this 400 days in jail, it was truly the hardest thing I ever tried. Uh, and at the same time, it's been the best Bible school I've ever been on. But I don't want to do it again. Let's say it like that. But it has truly been life transforming. Um, I started uh, 10 days of isolation in the beginning. After three days, I thought I was getting crazy. Like just be in a room in a small cell, like eight times 13 feet, yeah. uh, bond bags and sink and, and nothing to do. No phone, no papers, nothing to read. But after three days, somebody gave me an old King James Bible. And I'm not good at reading King James. But it was like, mm, I was kissing and hugging the, mm, oh, the Bible. I felt like one of the house missionaries in China. I'm like, oh, I got the Bible. And I just started to read. And, and later, I, I got a, another Bible somebody brought me. And, and I just read and read and read. And God revealed so much to me, especially about the end times and the kingdom of God and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ and the reward in heaven. And, you know, in the beginning, when I'm sitting there, one third of the New Testament is written from jail. So, you know, sitting in a jail reading New Testament, is, it is special. Like, like you read Philippians 4, 4, rejoice always in the Lord. I say rejoice. That was Paul's word. But Paul was not even an American dream when he wrote that. He was sitting in chains when he yeah. wrote that. So sitting in jail and, jail and read the same words, it, it opened our understanding I never had before. At the same time, I could not relate to the guys. 
I could not relate to those being whipped, the apostles in Acts, and they came rejoicing, being whipped, or Silas and Peter in Acts 16 was sitting in jail, chains and singing worship, or Paul said rejoice always, or, or all of it. I, I, it hurts, to be honest. I was like, it's more nice to read about it. Like I read about persecution and 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 it seems so pink, so yeah. beautiful. I did not feel God's present. I felt left alone. I was hurt. I was crying. I was confused. And it was really, really hard. Yeah. But by time, it happens. It, it happens, all of it. I saw it. And I came to that point, it maybe took me eight months, but I came to that point laying in, in my bed in my cell. Thank you, God, for putting me here. Thank you, God, for allowing this. Thank you, God, for this relationship. I'm so blessed. I'm so honored. But it, it took some months. And 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 I, I know today that I wrote two books in there. I know today that God also allowed this in heaven to me to prepare people prepare you and listener here for what is coming in the future because as I said right now it's only the few but later it will be the many and end up be all of us and and I would say don't fear but there is a lot of things I learned and I think most of us need to learn to experience things like this I, I heard a guy speak at a conference maybe two years ago and he had been arrested in Turkey um and he Andrew, was... Andrew Bronson. Yes, that's it. Yeah, I, I spoke with him when I came out. It was so interesting because I was like, whoa, I, I felt a relationship. I felt a, like it was so much the same, most of it. So it, it was really interesting to hear him. It was like, have he read my book? But he haven't. But yeah. but 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 I, it was much the same God did with him. Yeah. yeah. Of course, in different way. Uh, but yeah. Well, he, he I mean, he, he shared some things similar to what you're saying that I think, I think sometimes people have this romantic view that if they get persecuted, they're going to have like angels around them and it's all going to be wonderful. And he said he was in the depths of despair and he mm. wondered if he was going to lose his mind. Mm. And, you know, he, he ultimately came out and he's, you know, he's alive and mostly well, yeah. but he said, I'm still shaken by what happened mm. to me. Yeah. It really, it really, I mean, I, I wasn't expecting that and mm -hmm. anything could have happened. And by the grace of God, I'm here to talk to you and I'm alive. Yeah. I hear strains of that coming through what you're yeah. saying. Yours maybe wasn't yeah. here because it wasn't Turkey. I, I, was, I would say I, I saw revival. I think that was a big difference. Like from being alone, I had time revival at that size. Most people in, in many people in my door out of 25 inmates, there was 22 who came to Bible study every day. Uh, and and I, I saw beautiful things, like like God did amazing things. Just the last week before I was detained, we had a meeting in my dorm. I prayed for someone who fell down and got set free. I was sitting praying for the, the person on the floor, and then the uh, call over the loudspeaker. Why is he laying on the floor? And, and a few, two minutes later, the door opened, two guards came in, and he just stood up and said, I was still sitting on the floor. Who, who was on the floor? And I said, it, it was this guy who was on the floor. And then I said, he met God. And then he looked at him. So are you good? Yeah, I'm really good. And looked at me. Okay. As long as no one got hurt, have a good day. And then left. They called me the pastor, the preacher. And so I would say, I, I saw things happen. And I think that that make a big difference to really... Yeah. Yeah. be active my food is to do, do the will of him who sent me and, and and do his work and 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 he gave me so much life in there and and i i and 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 i felt a freedom i don't think he experienced the freedom inside there but again it took me like it took me eight months so so if i've come out in a month or two i think i've come up come out with the same experience he had in the beginning Right. Um, so, so it is not. It is. It is painful. Uh, it's just how it is. But God is faithful. Um, yeah. I think that's a super important point to make and a message for everyone who's listening to us, because God is faithful, but 
a lot of times people get angry with him because he doesn't respond when they think he should or in the way they think he should. And I think part of learning to be a disciple is is to pray as Jesus did, not my will, but thine be done. Mm. Nobody in their right mind wants to be persecuted yeah. or jailed or beaten or executed. But at the same time, I mean, we're, we're called to trust God. And sometimes yeah. the way that trust gets deepened is by being on the firing line and having, I mean, actually having to do it. Just like Simon, there was uh, a few fights in there and problems, and and even I saw uh, revival one time. Persecution also came for those who did not repent, and there was especially one guy. He was so noisy. He was the, the noise was the hardest. You couldn't go any place. Like, and there was people who were just creating problems all the time. And I was in in two fights with him. It didn't become physical, but but. He almost became, and and to be honest, it was very difficult to have him around me, and and he he was just so hard, big guy. Um, but then one time, I I started to see God's hand, and 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 saw that he was a servant in God's hand to humble me, to make me more like my Lord Jesus Christ. And when I start to see, like like Joseph, brother, throw him into the pit. Then uh, Potiphar's wife seduced him, and he went to jail. And we can see, unfair, unfair. Like my brother did this, and Potiphar's wife was lying. Unfair, unfair. But when you see the storyline and how it ends, it was not unfair. It was God who let it happen for Joseph to come to that point in his life, where a place in his life where he should. So he can fulfill the call God have. And I saw that those people who was most hard to me, painful, I, I, I God let me turn it around that, that they were actually God's servants, servants to humble me, to make me die to self and become more like Christ. And, and when I experienced that, freedom came. And suddenly love came for them. Why be bitter of people who do bad things against me? Why? Because they're all here to make me go to the cross. Like Jesus, I often say that Jesus could do without John, James, and Peter, but Jesus could not do without Judas. Judas was the only person necessary in Jesus' life to go to the cross. The same way we all need a Judas in our life, or sometimes more Judas, to make us go to the cross and fulfill the call God had for us. And, and I saw that, and I saw God's hand in it. Um, and I think that that made all the difference. And that was why I could rejoice and be thankful. It was not because the pain stopped. It was not because people lived. It was not because there was peace and quiet and no noise and no fights and no blood and no issues. No, but because you, I saw it through different lens, through different eyes. And, and this is what the Bible talks a lot about. We, we all need to know. And yeah, so a lot to share that. That's a, that's a very profound insight. We all need a Judas. I don't, I don't think most people would even stop to think about that in their personal devotions, but that's a very profound insight. Um, speaking of Judases, so you're a European, you're traveling widely, although not in the U.S. right now. Um, <clears throat> as you interact with believers, and I, 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 I'm thinking specifically of Western Europe, mm. um, or maybe in Central and South America, uh, and in those parts of Africa that historically have been under Western control, maybe places like, I don't know, Uganda and South Africa and Zimbabwe, places like that, not so much the Arab part of Africa. Um, are you finding that there are maybe similar trends or are you hearing stories of believers coming under opposition, persecution from their governments that you know, traditionally we would think, well, if you're in a Western nation, the government at best will be um, benign mm. and not your persecutor. Uh, but you've experienced something very different. Is that a rising trend in Western nations? Yeah, there's a case in Finland with a politician who there was a gate parade, a pa pa a pa gate things parade. in the city. Yeah, parade, sorry, parade. And she actually wrote a post, just a post where she quoted Romans about why do the Lutheran Church accept that? She was actually a member of the Lutheran Church in Finland. Why do you accept that? And then she quoted the Bible. 
And they actually wanted to take her to court because of that. And she was accused of war crimes. War crimes. And she act- yeah, war crimes. And she actually won first time. And now I've, I've heard they're trying to appeal it to uh, the Supreme Court in Finland. Uh, high Court. Why? Because it's been like, yeah, okay, let's say when I came to faith in 95, if I was applying for a job, I that time just wrote on my uh, uh, CV, I'm a Christian. Why? Because in my mind, a Christian at that time meant somebody who was sincere, who was working hard, who loved people, who was not stealing, who was not lying. That was that was my mind of being a Christian. Um, today, a uh, Christian is somebody who hates people, hate us, hate us against the uh, homosexual, hate us against people who have different beliefs, hate us, hate us, hate us, and and it's almost they have to be fought against and most news in the western world in europe and other places when you have to do with christians now is in a negative light you, you can just see like the the trist the manipulation they have changed um it's, it's yeah it's, you we know <laughs> news are controlled today by uh, the airway out of the airway uh, the, the god of this the god of the air the god of this world he is controlling the news in many ways. So there is a hate toward Christian. There is a skepticism toward Christian. And 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 it become more and more difficult. There was another guy in Malta. He was a homosexual. He just shared his testimony. Mm-mm-mm-mm. He was, he, I don't think he got arrested, but almost got arrested by sharing his own testimony. There was a woman in London, in the UK, who was praying outside a abortion clinic. She was praying silent inside. She was not allowed to do that. Yeah. yeah. So so there's more and more cases that is popping up and, and it's changing and it's happening and it's happening very, very fast. And 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 if if you just very short story, like Germany, we have seen World War with Hitler. I often say like this, uh, I've been out sweet. Sweet, uh, big, big now. I've seen the concentration camps. I've been in the Berlin Wall many times. I know the story of Hitler. Hitler's propaganda chief, Goebbels, he uh, he was the one who really used the media to manipulate people. And he was the one who said it's easy to get people to believe in a lie. Even it's a big lie, if it's just been told enough times. And they use censorship and uh, propaganda in the media. And what did they do? They created a division uh, 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 between the Jews and the Germans, where those Jews was going to take away your health, that's going to take away your wealth, your health and your wealth. And it created a fear that did that the normal German Mrs. and Mrs. Smith ended up killing their neighbor. What can get a German to be friends with neighbor and suddenly kill their neighbors? Um, six million Jews got killed and it was not Hitler who killed them all it was the Norman German who gave them over what can get people to do that fear fear, fear, fear and fear and how do you work with fear <laughs> propaganda like faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God fears come by hearing the other news of our enemy and this is what we see today there is a fear that has been sown into people to create the vision there's a fear from our enemy to the media to commercial to cartoons to disney to all of it there's going to create a hate toward the believers especially the radical believers and this is what is happening is is going is growing is maturing, and this is what we see in the Bible. In the end times, the wheat and the terror is going to grow, and both are going to mature at the same time. Right. And it's growing side by side. And I believe we see a church that will mature where we will see disciples living like the book of Acts, like Paul, Peter, James, and the rest of the apostles in power, filled with the Holy Spirit, also being persecuted. At the same time, we see the hate as we see. And, and out of Jesus' disciples, out of the 12, there was only one who did not become a martyr. So Jesus had a martyr percent over 90. So, so if we have a church of 100 people and Jesus was the pastor, there was only 10 who would not become a martyr. The rest would become martyrs. But that was also the gospel Jesus was preaching. If anyone wanted to follow me, he had to deny himself and take off the cross and follow me. It's not a gold cross. Oh, I'm carrying my cross here in gold. I even have a diamond mic necklace. No, it is a cross. He knew what the cross meant. 
But the good news is those who lay down the life for my sake and for the gospel would win it. And they will have an eternal inheritance. And they will those who overcome with inherit the heaven and the earth and all of that. So, so it is a, a mature thing that is happening and it has grown a lot. Just where we are today in America, if I go back, when I came to America in 2019, I said, persecution and come to America, but people are not ready for it. Most people said, no, it will not happen in America. Most people today would say it is happening. <laughs> so, so, so it's maturing on both sides. The church are being mature, yeah. but also the world are being mature. And this is what we are going to see in Matthew 13 happening right now. And, and it's, it's very special times we are living in. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the church will mature. We've got wheat and tares. These are very biblical themes. They grow up side by side. Um, what should individual Christians in the Western world who find themselves in a very different environment? They, they historically had a government that was benign or neglectful, but didn't really care one way or another, but is now actually their opponent. What's the right response for Christians to have in an environment like this? I would say, don't fear, but be wise. Jesus said, be wise as servant, innocent as stuff. And, and we have to be innocent. We have to live right. Because if we live wrong, the enemy will use it against us. If I've done anything wrong, I've already lost everything. So live right and be be wise. We need to not be fearful, but be wise. Uh, I'm a public person. I use YouTube. I've done that, but I, I cannot do anything else right now. It, it's, it's done with it. <laughs> I'm already out there. But I want to say to people, not be fearful, but be wise and be prepared for what is coming. Be, be aware of what you post or what you share and how you do things. And, and then really stand firm in the word of God. There's a lot of things in the Bible talk about persecution, like, First Peter letter is an amazing letter where he talks about the fire, fire, fire trials we are going through. And even we will suffer now for a short time, then stand firm in the faith and humble yourself under God and, and be sound minded and so on. So, so it is really live with God and, and be prepared with our relationship and clean up our life. I think that is the best we can do. It's not something we can prevent for heaven. It is a train that's going and it's going very fast and it's going in this direction. It's happening. Yeah. But what we can do is prepare ourselves for it by having the word of God inside of us. And I would say when 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 I was in isolation three days without the Bible, I was like, I need more word. I, why, why did I memorize small word? Why didn't I have more word? I've been preaching for over 20 years. But why I was in a place in my life where I did not have a Bible. I've never been in that place before. Like I have two Bibles here. I have a Bible in my car. I have a Bible in my bed. I have 10 Bibles on my phone. Like all of us, we have Bibles all over. And, and suddenly to be in a place without a Bible, that was very new for me. And there I understood I need the word of God inside of me. I need more of that. And I would say this is what we all need. You cannot live on other people's relationship with your with your father. It's you and your father. It's you and the Holy Spirit. It's you and Jesus Christ. So I would say each of us need to be connected with deep, deep roots. Mark 4 is talking about when the persecution set in, ground number two there, is those people who receive the word with gladness, but when persecution said in, they fall away. Why? Because they have no roots in them. And I think that is a problem today, especially with American Christianity. Sorry to say it, the mega churches, the way we do Christianity in many places, is so shallow. There is no roots, there is no foundation, there is no truth. There is like feel good message. You hear something that can keep you going the next week, and then you have to go back next week to hear something that can keep you going next week. And it's really emotional preaching instead of the truth, instead of the word. And I, I think we need to change the way we need to start to prepare the church to not only be church in good times, but also be church in bad times. Yeah. And and we don't start to build roots in people right now. I'm afraid for many it will be too late. Like I often say it like that. Most people in America, we look at the mega church and like, oh, we want to have a big church. But most of those churches, that day persecution really set in, they all disappear overnight. Yeah. 
the office there, then, then what is truly big is not many, it's not the many numbers that is big. How do people obey Christ in everyday life? How do they live a holy life? How are they led by the Holy Spirit? How do they obey Christ and as disciples? And how do they manage in persecution, in suffering, in pain? Um, that is what we need to build up in people. And, and then I think when we do that, then persecution will not make us weaker. Persecution will just draw us even more to God. And this is what we see a big, the mainstream church, many will fall away. But out of that, those people who really have it and love Jesus, they will not fall away, but they will fall in front of the cross. <laughs> and they will come even closer to God, and they will start to take it even more serious, this life. And then out of that, fruit will happen. Life will come to faith all over. And this is what I experienced in jail. Like when you read Philippians, Paul, Paul he said, to my jail, to my chains, many people have been encouraged with boldness to preach the gospel. We should think the opposite happened. If somebody is thrown into jail, then the rest would be afraid. We have many people in my network, in our network, Last Reformation, who when I was put into jail, they just got even more courage to preach even more bold than they ever done before. So putting me as the leader, put me to jail, have actually created boldness in so many other people where they, you should think the opposite is working, but it's not like that. It's really true what the Bible is saying in, in every area. So, yeah. You know, I notice in everything you're saying, um, this is the answer I expected, so I, I'm not in any way questioning it, but <clears throat> in everything you're saying, I haven't heard you once mention uh, taking up arms. I haven't once heard you mention, um, you know, staging demonstrations. You're just saying expect that this is part of the normal Christian life. And if it comes to you, then, you know, use it as an opportunity to draw closer to God. Um, and don't fall away in the midst of that kind of difficulty. I don't know that we're hearing a lot of sermons like that in Western churches these days. No. And you know, I think um, the greatest enemy is not those people who are after me. It is myself if I let it become better. If I if I if I let it take away my focus and, and then it will destroy me. But otherwise, it will not destroy me. Why? Because I'm in the hand of God. And if you read the Psalms, it's just beautiful again and again that God is righteous. God is going to intervene in due time, but we need to keep our heart pure amongst all things. And I think this is so, so important. Uh, so I have no bitter root, nothing against anyone who did it. I forgive everyone. I love everyone. I know that it happens because God allowed it to happen. Yeah. Why? And and I see the heavenly man brought a young. I don't know if you know that book. Uh, I love that book. And I read it many times. And he ever a saying in the book, he said, no children of God is ever going to put into jail unless God have a purpose and plan with it. And he said, it is like an egg, a chicken who's in an egg. The chicken have to be in that egg 28 days. If you come out 27 days, it will die. If you come out 29 days, it will die. It had to be there 28 days. The same, he said, when disciples are being thrown into jail, God allowed it, and they have to be in that environment for exactly that time, otherwise they're not fully developed. And that was why he said, we don't pray for people's release unless the Holy Spirit prompts us to do it. I read that. I read it before. I knew that quote. I did not, I did not agree with him. <laughs> in, in, in the beginning it, it took me a, it took me a half year but i would say after a half year i saw that i came to the same conclusion that the heavenly man and the house church movement in china have come to and and it made me happy that is the same conclusion why it's the same gospel we appreciate it's the same lord and his persecution and i think we in the western world we can learn a lot for those people in the persecuting country who are already gone through it because what they have learned they needed to learn to survive and we need to learn the same to survive so so i would say there's a lot of good to come after out of those and of course out of the bible so yeah i would say 
our weapons, Corinthians is saying, our weapons is not of this world. Our warfare is not of this world. It's a different war we are fighting. It's not against flesh and blood. And, and, and we are preaching the gospel. We are making the side, but we are changing the hearts of the people. And that is what we can do, one by one, changing the hearts of the people. Amen. Wow, what a way to end this. Torben, would you would you say a prayer for all of our listeners that in the days ahead, they can be strong, yeah. and do her well, and bring yeah. glory to the Lord, even in hardship? I would do that. And I would say also, we, I have Torben Sondergaard, Dot com if you want to read about my case and there's documents and files and, and all of this where you it's also teaching to prepare you for what is coming. Let, let's pray for everyone out there and also if you're sick just put your hand on the sick place on your heart and I will pray for that also. God I thank you we thank you for everyone who has seen this who are listening God thank you because that they should not fear. They should not fear, but have faith, God. Believe in you, God. But also that if there's things in their life that's not right, if they have allowed sin, if there's things they have uh, done that they should not have done and come away from the narrow road, God, God, pray that they will repent, God. Pray that they will come close to you, God, that they will seek you, that they will pray, that they will fast, that they will come into a relationship with you, God, where they will not only start this race, but they will finish this race very strong, God, standing firm in their faith, God. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit over them. I pray for your boldness to preach the gospel wherever they come, God. And I pray for healing to everyone right now, God. God, come with your Holy Spirit. Come with freedom, that pain. Go right now in the name of Jesus. I command every pain, every spirit of fear, every depression, anxiety. We speak to it and we command that to go in the name of Jesus. I speak freedom to you. I speak healing to you. I speak boldness to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, for drawing everyone who listen here and that this is going to be the beginning all of new journey in their life come with your holy spirit with your freedom more than god i thank you for every one of them god in the name of jesus christ jesus we love you and we thank you amen 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 torben what a what a blessing to have had you on our show today and what a pleasure to meet you i uh i come to europe okay. usually a couple times a year maybe maybe i'll uh contact you before i come and i'll come well, over now, to... now now i'm mexico so let's, let's I, see I, where I, I don't have any plans for mexico yeah this. yeah but it's good yeah it's good uh let's see but thank you thank you for allowing me to allow uh, let me give the opportunity to share my story i i really wanted to come out to people because i i believe it's important it's for this time it's for this season we all live in it so uh, be bold, preach the gospel, you in, in America. I'm not there right now, but the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So be bold, uh, make disciples in your everyday life. Yeah. Amen. Grant, you Amen. have anything you want to add before we sign off? I I wanted to stay and talk with Torben for the next three or four hours, but I know we can't. So uh -huh. uh, maybe maybe we can have him back and... Uh, and uh, get an update and, and all of that, just to let everyone know um, his uh, a link to his website will be in the, sh in the show notes below. And so you can, uh, you can find all his information there uh, as well. Be praying for him. And, um, and yeah, let's talk to our, uh, our congressmen or our representatives and uh, let's try to get this thing uh, taken care of. That'd be great uh, for sure. So thank you. Thank you both so much uh, for taking time out to be with us. And thank you all for listening. Uh, to another episode of God is not a theory with Ken Fish.